He would certainly have woken not much later, even without being disturbed, for he felt sufficiently rested and refreshed. But it seemed to him that he had been roused by hurried steps and a cautious closing of the door that led into the hall. The light of the electric street lamps flickered paddedly on the ceiling and the upper parts of the furniture, but down where Gregor lay, it was dark. Slowly, still groping awkwardly with his feelers, which he was only now beginning to appreciate, he dragged himself over to the door to see what had been happening there. His left side felt like one long, unpleasantly tautening scar, and he was reduced to limping on his twin rows of legs. One leg, moreover, had been seriously damaged in the course of the morning's events. It was almost a miracle that only one had been damaged, and trailed limply after him. Only when he reached the door did he notice what had actually lured him there. It was the smell of something to eat for there stood a bowl brimming with sweetened milk in which little slices of white bread were floating. He could almost have laughed for joy, because he was even hungrier than he had been in the morning, and he promptly dipped his head into the milk almost up to his eyes. But he soon drew it back again in disappointment, not merely because eating caused him difficulties due to his tender left side. He could only eat if his whole panting body participated but because he did not care for the milk at all, despite it normally being his favourite drink, for which reason his sister had certainly put it down for him. Indeed, he turned away from the bowl with repugnance and crawled back into the middle of the room. In the living room the gas had already been lit, as Gregor could see through the crack in the door. But whereas at this time of day his father always used to read aloud extracts from his evening paper to his mother and sometimes his sister as well, everything now was utterly silent. What a quiet life the family has been leading, Gregor said to himself, and felt so proud as he sat there staring into the darkness that he had been able to provide his parents and sister with a life of this sort in such a pleasant apartment. But what if all the peace, the prosperity, the contentment were now to come to a terrible end? In order not to lose himself in such thoughts, Gregor chose to move about and crawled back and forth across the room. During the long evening, first one of the side doors and then the other was opened slightly and quickly shut again. Somebody had presumably needed to come in, but had had too many misgivings. Gregor now stationed himself directly in front of the living room door, determined somehow to get his hesitant visitor into the room, or at least to discover who it might be. But the door was not opened again, and Gregor waited in vain. In the morning, when the doors had been locked, everyone had wanted to come in. Now, when he had opened one door and the others had clearly been opened during the day... No one came any more, and the keys, moreover, were now on the outside. It wasn't until late in the evening that the light was turned off in the living room, and it became clear that his parents and sister had stayed up all that time, for all three of them could now be distinctly heard moving away on tiptoe. Certainly no one would now come into Gregor's room until morning. He therefore had a long time to consider in peace and quiet how best to reorganize his life. But the high-ceilinged, spacious room in which he was obliged to lie flat on the floor filled him with an anguish he could not account for, since it was, after all, the room he had lived in for the past five years. And with a half-conscious change of direction, and not without a slight feeling of shame, he scuttled under the couch, where, although his back was a little squashed and he could not raise his head any more, he immediately felt quite comfortable and was only sorry that his body was too broad to fit completely under the couch. There he stayed the whole night, either dozing and being continually jolted awake by pangs of hunger, or in worries and vague hopes, all of which, however, led to the conclusion that for the time being he had to stay calm, and by exercising patience and being as considerate as possible to his family, make bearable the unpleasantness that he was compelled to cause them in his present condition. By early next morning, 
It was still almost night. Gregor had an opportunity to test the firmness of his new resolve, for his sister, almost fully dressed, opened the door from the hall and looked uneasily in. She did not see him immediately, but when she spotted him beneath the couch, good heavens, he had to be somewhere, he couldn't have just flown away, she got such a fright that she lost control of herself and slammed the door shut again from the outside. But, as if regretting her behaviour, she immediately opened the door again and tiptoed into the room, as though she were visiting someone seriously ill, or even a stranger. Gregor had stuck his head out almost to the edge of the couch and was observing her. Would she notice that he had left the milk standing, though not because he had no appetite, far from it, and would she bring in some other food that suited him better? If she didn't do so of her own accord, he would rather starve than bring it to her attention, although, in fact, he felt a tremendous urge to dart out from under the couch, throw himself at his sister's feet, and beg her to bring him something good to eat. His sister, however, noticed immediately and with astonishment the still full bowl, from which only a little milk had splattered all around, picked it up, admittedly not with her bare hands but with a cloth, and carried it out. Gregor was extremely curious to know what she would bring instead, and indulged in all manner of speculation. But never could he have guessed what his sister in the goodness of her heart actually did. In order to find out what he liked... She brought him a whole selection of things, all spread out on an old newspaper, old, half-rotten vegetables, bones left over from supper, surrounded by congealed white sauce, some raisins and almonds, some cheese that two days earlier Gregor had declared inedible, a slice of dry bread, a slice of bread and butter, and another spread with butter and salted. In addition to all this, she also put down the bowl, which had probably been permanently assigned to Gregor, and into which she had poured some water. And, out of a sense of delicacy, since she knew that Gregor would not eat in her presence, she hastily withdrew and even turned the key in the lock to let Gregor know that he could make himself as comfortable as he wished. Gregor's little legs whirred as he made his way to the food. His wounds, moreover, must have completely healed by now, for he felt no further impediment which astonished him, and he remembered how more than a month earlier he had cut his finger ever so slightly with a knife, and how this finger had still been hurting him only the day before yesterday. Might I have grown less sensitive, he thought, already sucking greedily on the cheese which had attracted him immediately and more forcibly than all the other food. In quick succession, and with tears of contentment welling in his eyes, he devoured the cheese, the vegetables, and the sauce. The fresh food, on the other hand, did not appeal to him. He couldn't even stand the smell, and he actually dragged the things he did not wish to eat a little further off. He had long finished everything and was just lying lazily on the same spot when, as a sign that he should withdraw, his sister slowly turned the key. That immediately made him start, despite the fact that he was almost dozing off, and he scuttled back beneath the couch. But it took enormous self-control to stay under the couch, even for the short time that his sister was in the room, since the copious meal had bloated his body a little, and he could hardly breathe in that cramped space. In between brief bouts of suffocation, he watched with slightly bulging eyes as his unsuspecting sister took a broom and swept up not only the remains of what he had eaten, but even the food that Gregor had not touched, as if it too were now unusable, and then dumped everything hastily into a bucket which she covered with a wooden lid before carrying everything out. She had hardly turned her back when Gregor came out from under the couch to stretch and distend his belly. This was how Gregor now received his food each day, once in the morning while his parents and the maid were still asleep, and again when everyone had had lunch, for then his parents took another short nap and the maid was sent on some errand or other by his sister. They surely did not want him to starve either, but... Perhaps the only way they could bear to find out about his eating habits was by hearsay. 
What pretexts had been used on that first morning to get the doctor and the locksmith out of the apartment, Gregor was quite unable to discover, for since the others could not understand what he said, it did not occur to anyone, not even his sister, that he might be able to understand other people. And so, when his sister was in his room, he had to content himself with hearing her intermittent sighs and invocations to the saints. It was only later, when she had begun to get used to everything, there could never, of course, be any question of a complete adjustment, that Gregor sometimes seized on a remark that was meant to be friendly or could be so interpreted. He really liked his food today, she would say when Gregor had licked his bowl clean, and when the opposite was true, which gradually occurred more and more frequently. She would say almost sadly, He's left everything again. But although Gregor could not discover anything directly, he did overhear a fair amount from the adjoining rooms, and whenever he heard voices he would run at once to the appropriate door and press his whole body against it. Especially in the early days, there was no conversation that did not in some way, if only clandestinely, refer to him. For two whole days there were consultations to be heard at every meal about how they should now proceed, but the same topic was also discussed between meals, for at least two members of the family were always at home, probably because no one wanted to be at home alone and because leaving the apartment completely empty was out of the question. Besides, the maid had, on the very first day, it was not quite clear what or how much she knew of what had happened, gone to his mother and begged on her bended knees to be dismissed at once, and when she took her leave a quarter of an hour later, she thanked them in tears for her dismissal, as if it had been the greatest favour ever conferred on her, and vowed without any prompting a fearful oath that she would never breathe a word to anyone. Now Gregor's sister, with her mother's help, had to do the cooking as well although that did not, of course, involve much work since they ate practically nothing. Time and again Gregor heard one of them vainly exhorting the other to eat and never getting any other answer than thank you, I've had enough, or something similar. They didn't seem to drink anything either. His sister often asked his father if he wanted a beer and kindly offered to fetch it herself, and when his father made no reply, she said, in order to remove any misgivings he might have, that she could send the janitor's wife to fetch it, whereupon his father uttered a decisive no, and that was the last they heard of it. In the course of the very first day, his father explained fully the family's financial situation and prospects to both mother and sister. From time to time he rose from the table and took some receipt or notebook out of his small Vertime safe that he had held on to even after the collapse of his business five years earlier. He could be heard opening the complicated lock and closing it once he had taken out what he was looking for. These explanations by his father were, to some extent, the first encouraging news Gregor had heard since his imprisonment. He had always assumed that his father had been left with nothing at all from that business, or at least his father had never told him anything to the contrary, and Gregor himself had never asked him. Gregor's sole concern in those days had been to do everything in his power to help his family forget as quickly as possible the commercial disaster that had plunged them all into utter despair. And so he had set to work with quite exceptional zeal and risen almost overnight from junior clerk to travelling salesman, in which capacity he naturally had many more possibilities of earning money, since his successes could be immediately translated by way of commission into ready cash that could be laid on the table at home before the astonished and delighted eyes of his family. Those had been wonderful times, which had never been repeated at least not so gloriously, although Gregor subsequently earned so much money that he was in a position to meet the entire family's expenses, and actually did so. They had simply got used to it. The family as well as Gregor. They accepted the money with gratitude, he gave it with pleasure, but no special feelings of warmth were engendered any more. Only his sister had remained close to Gregor, and it had been his secret plan that she, who, unlike him, loved music and could play the violin most movingly, 
should be sent next year to the Conservatoire, regardless of the great expense it would entail and which he would somehow meet. During Gregor's short stays in town, the Conservatoire would often crop up in conversations with his sister, but never as anything more than a beautiful dream which could not possibly be fulfilled, and their parents did not even like to hear these innocent illusions. Gregor, however, had very fixed ideas on the subject, and intended to make the solemn announcement on Christmas Eve. Such were the thoughts, utterly futile in his present condition, that passed through his mind as he clung there upright glued to the door and listened. Sometimes, out of general exhaustion, he could not pay attention any longer and let his head bump carelessly against the door. But he immediately held it up again, for even the tiny noise this made had been heard in the next room and reduced them all to silence. "'What on earth is he up to now?' said his father after a while, obviously turning towards the door, and only then would the interrupted conversation gradually be resumed. Gregor now became thoroughly acquainted, for his father was in the habit of repeating himself frequently in his explanations, partly because he had not concerned himself with these matters for quite some time, and partly because his mother could not always grasp things on first hearing, with the fact that, despite all their misfortune, a sum of money, admittedly very small, was still intact from the old days. But besides that, the money Gregor had brought home every month, he had kept only a few golden for himself, had not all been used up and had accumulated into a modest capital. Gregor nodded vigorously behind his door, delighted at this unexpected foresight and thrift. He could, in fact, have used this surplus money to pay off more of his father's debts to his boss, thus bringing much closer the day when he could quit his job. But as things stood, the way his father had arranged it was undoubtedly better. Yet his money was by no means sufficient for the family even to consider living off the interest. It might have sufficed to support them for one or at most two years, but that was all. It was therefore merely a sum that should not actually be touched, but rather put aside for an emergency. Money to live on had to be earned. Now Gregor's father, though in good health, was an old man who had not worked for five years, and could not in any case be expected to take on too much. During those five years, the first holiday of his arduous yet unsuccessful life, he had put on a lot of fat and had consequently become very sluggish. And was Gregor's old mother now supposed to go out and earn money? When, suffering as she did from asthma, she found it a strain even to walk round the flat, and spent every other day lying on the sofa by the open window, gasping for breath. And was his sister now to go out to work, who at seventeen was still a child, and whose way of life no one would have begrudged her, consisting, as it did, of dressing prettily, sleeping late, helping in the house, enjoying a few modest amusements, and above all playing the violin, Whenever the conversation turned to this need to earn money, Gregor would first let go of the door and then throw himself down on the cool leather sofa beside it, for he felt quite hot with shame and grief. Often he would lie there all night long, not sleeping a wink but merely scratching at the leather for hours on end. Or he would crawl up to the window sill and lean against the window, evidently responding to a vague memory of that sense of freedom which looking out of the window had once given him. For as the days went by, he did in fact see things even a short distance away, less and less distinctly. The hospital opposite, which he used to curse because he saw so much of it, he could now no longer see at all. And had he not known perfectly well that he lived in the quiet but decidedly urban Charlottenstrasse, he might have thought that what he saw from his window was a wilderness in which the grey sky and grey earth were indistinguishably mingled. 
If only Gregor had been able to speak to his sister and thank her for everything she had to do for him, he could have accepted her efforts more easily. But as it was, they caused him pain. His sister certainly tried to ease the embarrassment of the whole situation as much as she could, and as time went on she became more and more successful. But with time Gregor too saw everything much more clearly. Her very entrance was terrible for him. The moment she crossed the threshold, without pausing to shut the door, even though she was otherwise most careful to spare everyone the sight of Gregor's room, she ran straight to the window, hastily tore it open, as if she was almost suffocating, remained there a while, no matter how cold it was, breathing deeply. She terrified Gregor twice daily with all this crashing around. He spent the whole time trembling beneath the couch, even though he knew perfectly well that she would certainly have spared him this, if only she had been capable of staying in a room occupied by Gregor with the window closed. Once, it must have been a month since Gregor's transformation, and there was no particular reason now for his sister to be astonished at his appearance, she came a little earlier than usual and caught Gregor, motionless and at his most terrifying looking out of the window. It would not have surprised Gregor if she had not come in, because his position prevented her from opening the window at once. But not only did she not come in, she even sprang back and shut the door. A stranger might almost have thought that Gregor had been lying in wait for her, intending to bite her. Gregor, of course, immediately hid himself beneath the couch, but he had to wait until noon before his sister returned, and she seemed much more restless than usual. He realized from this that the sight of him was still unbearable to her, and was bound to remain unbearable, and that it probably required enormous self-control on her part not to run away at the sight of even the small portion of his body that jutted out from under the couch. And, in order to spare her this sight, he managed one day... The task took him four hours to carry the bedsheet on his back over to the couch and drape it in such a way that he was now completely covered, making it impossible for his sister to see him even if she bent down. Had she considered this sheet unnecessary, she could of course have removed it, for it was clear enough that it gave Gregor no pleasure to close himself off so completely, but she left the sheet the way it was. For the first fortnight, his parents could not bring themselves to enter his room, and he often heard them wholeheartedly acknowledging the work his sister was now doing, whereas before they had frequently been annoyed with her, because she seemed to them a somewhat unhelpful girl. But now both of them, his father and his mother, often waited outside Gregor's room while his sister cleaned it out, and as soon as she emerged, she had to give them a detailed account of how the room looked, what Gregor had eaten, and whether he had perhaps shown a slight improvement. His mother, incidentally, wanted to visit Gregor relatively early on, but his father and sister succeeded at first in dissuading her with rational arguments, to which Gregor listened most attentively and with unreserved approval. Later, though, she had to be restrained by force, and when she cried out, Let me see my Gregor, my own unhappy son, Gregor thought it might be a good thing after all if his mother did come in. Not every day, of course, but perhaps once a week. She really did understand everything so much better than his sister, who had, perhaps when all was said and done, only taken on so hard a task out of childish recklessness. <laughs>